I found her second wedding ring in the glove compartment. It wasn't the one I gave her nine years ago with tears in my eyes, promising forever. No, this was something else entirely simple, silver, smaller than the one I'd saved for months to buy. It felt cold in my hand, heavier than it should have been, like it was full of secrets. I don't know what made me open the glove box that afternoon. I was just looking for the car manual. The check engine light had come on during my drive home, and Emma's car was parked in the driveway. She was still at work, or so I thought, and I figured I'd grab the manual to see if I could troubleshoot. But when I opened it, I didn't find the manual. I found a little black box instead. I stared at it for a second, confused. We hadn't bought anything fancy lately, no reason to have jewelry stashed away. I picked it up, opened the lid, and there it was. A ring. Not mine. Not hers. Not ours. It was sitting there like it belonged, like it had been waiting for me to find it. And in that moment, I knew something was wrong. Very, very wrong. I stood there in the garage, holding that ring like a goddamn idiot, turning it over and over in my hand. The engine light? Completely forgotten. There was no manual in the glove box, no problem to fix. Except this one. This new, unexpected mess I had no idea how to even begin untangling. I placed the box back, carefully, like it was some delicate bomb that might go off if I didn't handle it just right. My mind raced through possibilities. Maybe it was a gift for someone else, her sister, a friend, something completely innocent. I wanted to believe that's so bad. But why would she hide it in the glove compartment? If it was innocent, why not just leave it in the house, in her jewelry box, or somewhere normal? That little black box felt like a neon sign screaming you don't know everything about her. The more I thought about it, the more the pit in my stomach grew. I could already feel myself sinking into that nauseating, paranoid state I swore I'd never allow. I was never going to be one of those guys, the ones who lost sleep over their partner's every move, who needed to know where she was at all times, who rifled through her things looking for signs of betrayal. But there I was, standing in the garage, my pulse racing, my mouth dry, questioning everything. I tried to shove it out of my mind. It was just a ring, right? Maybe it was nothing. So I went inside, flicked on the TV, and pretended like I hadn't just found the most unsettling thing in our marriage. But the noise from the show couldn't drown out my thoughts. Every few minutes, I found myself glancing toward the door, wondering when she'd come home, wondering how I could even begin to bring this up without sounding like a lunatic. When she finally did walk in, it felt like I was seeing her for the first time in a long time. You know how you can be with someone for years and, suddenly, one day you look at them and something feels off? I noticed little things, her clothes a bit more done up than usual, makeup more precise, her hairstyle like she'd put more time into it than she did for me. It wasn't over the top, but subtle enough to make me wonder. Hey, she said, smiling. She tossed her keys on the counter like nothing was different, like everything was just fine. What's for dinner? I was still sitting on the couch, the TV blaring behind me, but I hadn't been watching for the last hour. I just stared at her feeling my throat tighten, trying to figure out how to ask about the ring without sounding insane. I was thinking about ordering pizza, I muttered, stalling. How was work? Same old, she shrugged, moving toward the fridge. She opened it and pulled out a bottle of water, completely casual. Completely normal. Except nothing felt normal. I couldn't let it go. The ring was like a fire in the back of my mind, burning hotter every second. Whose car were you using today? I asked, trying to sound like I was just making conversation. She glanced at me, unscrewing the bottle cap. Mine. Why? I swallowed. The ball was already rolling. You sure? Because the engine light came on, and I was going to grab the manual to check it out, but I couldn't find it. There was a split-second pause. Just a flash of something on her face before she turned back toward the fridge. Yeah, probably just needs an oil change or something. You know how these newer cars are. Don't worry about it. I'll take it to the shop tomorrow. She closed the fridge and walked over to the counter, picking up her phone. 
Do you want pepperoni or something else? I watched her fingers swipe across the screen. She was being too casual. Too smooth. It didn't fit with the knot in my gut, the one tightening every time I thought about that ring. I had to know. What's in the glove compartment? I asked, more directly this time. Her fingers stopped moving. She looked up at me, her smile fading just slightly. What do you mean? I found a box in there, I said, my voice sounding more accusing than I intended. A little black box. You hiding something from me? She blinked, and I could see her processing, the gears turning in her head. For a second, I thought I might have been wrong. I hoped she'd laugh it off, call me ridiculous, explain the whole thing. But she didn't laugh. Her face changed, just a little, just enough. Oh, she said, and I watched as she took a slow breath. That. The fact that she didn't immediately offer an explanation made my stomach drop. Yeah. That. She set her phone down on the counter and leaned against it, her body language shifting. She wasn't nervous. She was composed, like she had been rehearsing this. It's nothing, she said finally, folding her arms. I didn't tell you because it's just stupid. It's a wedding ring, I said, standing up. My voice was shaking now, the edge creeping in. A second wedding ring, hidden in your car. How the hell is that nothing? She sighed, brushing her hair out of her face. It's not what you think, okay? Just, relax. Relax? My pulse was pounding in my ears. Emma, what the hell is going on? She looked at me then, eyes steady, and said, it's not for you. Those four words hit me harder than anything else. I felt like someone had punched me in the chest. I was standing there, staring at the woman I'd built my life with, and I could feel it crumbling right in front of me. She didn't flinch. Didn't stutter. She just, admitted it. Not for me? I repeated, my voice barely a whisper. Then who's it for? There was a long, painful silence. She didn't answer right away, and that was all the confirmation I needed. I felt the floor give out beneath me, that dizzying sensation when everything you thought was real turns out to be a lie. I knew, in that moment, my worst fear was true. Who's it for, Emma? I asked again, this time louder, my hands shaking. She closed her eyes, took another deep breath, and finally said the name that would change everything. It's for David. David. Of course. Her co-worker. The guy she'd been working late with for the past six months. The guy I hadn't thought twice about, because why would I? He was married too, just another guy in the office. I'd met him once, briefly, at some corporate function. He shook my hand, smiled, and I thought nothing of it. Now, his name felt like poison in my mouth. How long? I asked, my voice shaking with anger. Emma didn't look at me. Does it matter? That was it. That was all she had to say. No apologies. No explanations. Just cold, detached indifference. As if this was something that had just happened. Something that didn't involve me, the man she'd promised to love, honor, and cherish. Yeah, Emma, I said, my voice rising, it does matter. She looked at me then, her eyes hard. We've been seeing each other for a while. It's not some fling. I didn't want to hurt you, but I couldn't keep pretending everything was fine between us. Pretending? I felt like I was about to explode. You've been screwing around with someone else, and I'm the one pretending? She flinched at the word screwing, but she didn't deny it. She just stood there, arms crossed, as if she was the one who had been wronged. As if I was the one overreacting. You don't get it, she said quietly, her voice almost pleading. You don't know what it's like to feel so, empty all the time. I needed something more. I needed to feel, something. You haven't been there for me, not really. You haven't been listening. My blood was boiling now. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So, this is my fault? You're blaming me for this? I'm not blaming you, she said, but her tone was defensive. 
I'm just saying that things haven't been right for a long time. And David, he understands me in a way you never could. That was the dagger. It wasn't just about sex. It was about something deeper, something she felt I couldn't give her. That was the real betrayal. Not just the physical act, but the fact that she'd turned to someone else to fill whatever void she claimed I couldn't. I stood there, shaking with rage, trying to process what she'd just said. My mind was spinning, and all I wanted to do was yell, scream, throw something, but I couldn't. I just stood there, frozen, as everything I thought I knew fell apart. You wanted more? I asked, my voice barely controlled. What the hell does that even mean? We have a house, a life, a marriage. What more did you need? Emma shook her head, as if I was missing the point. It's not about the stuff, okay? It's about the connection. The feeling. I needed to go deeper, and you just, you don't know how. I didn't even recognize her anymore. The woman standing in front of me wasn't my wife. She was a stranger. A stranger who had been living a double life, hiding in plain sight, and I had been too blind to see it. And David does? I spat, my voice dripping with sarcasm. He gets you? He knows how to go deeper? Emma didn't respond. She just looked away, her arms still crossed, as if she had already made up her mind. And that's when it hit me, she wasn't going to fight for this. She wasn't going to apologize, wasn't going to beg for forgiveness. She had already checked out. In her mind, this was already over. I took a step back, my hands shaking, my heart pounding in my chest. I couldn't believe this was happening. I couldn't believe that the woman I'd shared my life with was standing here, telling me she needed something deeper from another man. Unbelievable, I muttered, turning away from her. Fucking unbelievable. Emma said nothing. She just stood there, watching as I walked out of the room, my entire world crashing down around me. The silence in the house was suffocating after our argument. I hadn't stormed out, not yet, but I was close. I went upstairs, pacing, trying to calm down, but my mind was a mess of anger, betrayal, and confusion. This wasn't some misunderstanding. This was real Emma had cheated, and not just physically. It was emotional, too. She'd found something with him, David, that she said I couldn't give her. The betrayal was sharp, cutting into every memory we had together, rewriting our entire relationship in my head. I couldn't just leave it there. I couldn't just walk away from this without more answers. She was downstairs, probably waiting for me to come back down, maybe even hoping I wouldn't. But I wasn't done. I went back downstairs, slowly, every step feeling like I was preparing for a battle I wasn't ready for. Emma was sitting at the kitchen table, phone in hand, scrolling through something like she wasn't in the middle of destroying our life together. I wanted to grab the phone and throw it across the room. Instead, I sat down across from her. We're not done, I said. She looked up at me, and there was something cold in her eyes. Detached. She didn't even look guilty. I figured, she replied, like this was just some business conversation. I couldn't wrap my head around how calm she was. Like this was no big deal. So, explain it to me, I said, leaning forward. Explain how you could do this. You've been with him for months, months, Emma. You've lied to my face. You've gone to work every day, come home to me every night, and pretended like everything was fine. How the hell could you do that? She sighed, like she was annoyed I didn't already understand. I told you, it's not that simple. Things haven't been good between us for a long time. Not that simple? I laughed, though it wasn't out of humor. You've been sleeping with another man behind my back for God knows how long, and it's not that simple? Are you hearing yourself right now? I didn't plan for it to happen, she said quietly, looking down at the table. It just, it did. I tried to ignore it at first, I really did. I thought it was just some stupid crush or something, but it didn't go away. And then we started talking more, and I realized. I don't know, I just felt something for him that I haven't felt with you in a long time. That's bullshit, I snapped. 
That's the kind of excuse people make when they don't want to admit they're selfish. You don't accidentally fuck someone else, Emma. You made a choice. Every single time, you chose to lie to me, to sneak around, to break our marriage apart. And for what? For David? A guy from work? She flinched at my tone, but didn't back down. You think it's that simple, don't you? Like I just woke up one day and decided to cheat on you. But you haven't been there for me. Not really. We've been coasting for years, and you didn't even notice. You think just being in the same house and doing the same routine means we're okay? We're not, and we haven't been for a long time. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And what, you couldn't talk to me about it? You couldn't say a single thing? Instead, you just decided to fuck another guy to feel better? It wasn't about that, she shot back, finally looking at me with some emotion. It wasn't about just sex. It was more than that. It was about feeling, alive again. About feeling connected. You don't get it. You never have. Don't you dare blame me for this, I said, my voice rising. Don't you fucking dare. I've been here, every single day, working, supporting us, building a life. And this is what I get in return. You turning around and saying it wasn't enough, that I wasn't enough? What more could I have done, Emma? She shook her head, exasperated. It's not about what you could have done. It's about how I felt. I felt alone, even when you were right there next to me. I felt like I was screaming for something more, and you couldn't hear me. I needed more than what we had, and David gave me that. So, you just, what? Decided to start a new life with him behind my back? I asked, my hands clenched into fists under the table. Is that it? You're just going to leave everything we built together for some fling with a guy who probably doesn't even care about you? She didn't answer right away. The silence was heavy, almost unbearable. And when she did speak, her voice was calm again, too calm. It's not a fling, she said softly. It's real. Those words hit me harder than anything else. I felt like I was being gutted right there in my own kitchen. Real? I repeated. You're saying what we had wasn't real. She shook her head again. That's not what I mean. I loved you, I still do. But it's different now. We're different. Different doesn't mean you cheat, Emma, I said, leaning forward, my voice harsh. You don't get to rewrite the rules just because you're bored or unsatisfied. That's not how marriage works. I wasn't bored, she said, her voice wavering slightly. I was. I was empty. And he made me feel something again. I didn't mean for it to go this far. I didn't. But now that it has. I don't know how to go back. Go back? I laughed bitterly. You think there's a way to go back from this? You think I can just forget what you've done? I'm not asking you to forget, she snapped, her composure cracking. I'm asking you to understand. You didn't lose me because of David. You lost me because you stopped paying attention a long time ago. And that justifies this? I asked, my anger boiling over again. You think that's an excuse for screwing around with him? No, but it's the truth, she said, her voice quieter now. I didn't set out to hurt you. I didn't plan this. But I can't change the way things are now. I sat back in my chair, staring at her, the woman I thought I knew better than anyone else. But now, looking at her, I realized I didn't know her at all. The person sitting across from me wasn't the woman I married. She wasn't the woman who promised to be with me through thick and thin, for better or worse. She was a stranger. So, what now? I asked, my voice flat. What do you want from me? She didn't answer right away. Instead, she looked down at her hands, like she was searching for the right words. I don't know, she finally said. I don't know what happens next. I didn't think this far ahead. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. You didn't think this far ahead? 
Jesus Christ, Emma, you've been sleeping with another man for months. You've been lying to me, betraying me, and you didn't think about what would happen when I found out? I didn't want to hurt you, she said, her voice cracking slightly. I didn't want this to happen. But it did, I said, my voice hard. You made sure it happened. And now you're sitting here, telling me you don't know what to do? What do you think happens now, Emma? You think I just forgive you? We just, move on like this never happened? I don't know, she whispered, tears finally filling her eyes. I don't know how to fix this. Her tears didn't move me. Not this time. Not after what she'd done. I'd spent too long being understanding, too long giving her the benefit of the doubt. And where had it gotten me? Sitting across from a woman who didn't care that she'd blown up our life, waiting for me to decide what to do about it. Well, I'll tell you what happens next, I said, standing up. You're going to pack a bag and get out. I can't even look at you right now. I don't want you here. Not after this. Her eyes widened, and for the first time, she looked truly scared. Wait, please, let's talk about this. Talk? I scoffed. What's there to talk about? You've already made your choice. You chose him. Now live with it. She stood up, coming around the table toward me, reaching for my arm. No, please, we can figure this out. I'm sorry, I am. I didn't mean for it to go this far, I swear. I love you. I do. Don't throw everything away over this. I stepped back, yanking my arm away from her. Don't touch me, I growled. You don't get to stand here and act like you care now. Not after all this. She stood there, tears streaming down her face, her hands trembling at her sides. Please, she whispered. Don't do this. Don't leave me. I'm sorry, I'll fix it. I'll do anything. Just, don't end this. I wanted to scream at her, tell her she was the one who had ended this, the second she let another man into her life. But I was too tired, too broken to keep fighting. Instead, I turned and walked out of the room, leaving her standing there, sobbing. It didn't matter anymore. Whatever we had, whatever we were, it was over. She was crying, and I should have felt something for that, maybe some part of me did, way deep down where the good memories still lived. But as I heard her soft sobs from the kitchen, it was all drowned out by this tidal wave of anger that had taken over. She was begging me to stay, to talk it out, but I couldn't. I didn't want to talk anymore. Talking hadn't stopped her from screwing David for months, and it sure as hell wasn't going to change anything now. I didn't walk out of the house right away like I had originally planned. No, I needed to think. To plot. Walking out would have been too easy for her, letting her cry herself to sleep, then wake up the next morning to face whatever came next. She'd want to fix it, claim it was all a mistake, say she was sorry, what, so I could sweep it all under the rug and try to pretend she hadn't just thrown our life in the trash? No. She destroyed everything we'd built, and now she had to pay for it. Upstairs, in the bedroom we shared, I stood there looking around at everything we had, pictures of vacations, date nights, anniversaries, years of our life together, scattered around the room like evidence of a crime. The bed we slept in, where we held each other, now felt like a stage for some sick performance. How many nights had she come home after being with him, climbed into that bed next to me, and pretended nothing was wrong? I stared at it, feeling disgusted, and suddenly, I couldn't bear the sight of any of it. I grabbed the picture frames off the dresser, one by one, smashing the glass against the edge of the bed. Shards flew across the room, and I didn't care. The sound was strangely satisfying, like every crash was a little piece of the rage inside me being let loose. Photos of us on our honeymoon, from Christmases past, from birthdays and anniversaries, they all ended up in a pile on the floor, their faces twisted behind cracked glass. They were lies now. All of it. But smashing pictures wasn't enough. No, I needed something bigger, something that would hurt her as much as she'd hurt me. I stood there for a moment, thinking about what I could do. Walking out and filing for divorce was one option, sure. But she'd get half of everything, wouldn't she? That's what happens when you play it nice. No, 
I wanted her to feel what it was like to have everything she cared about ripped away in one fell swoop. She didn't deserve to walk away from this unscathed. Not after what she did to me. I reached for my phone. I wasn't going to call her friends or family and make some dramatic scene. I wasn't going to rant on Facebook about how I'd been betrayed. No, there were easier, quieter ways to break someone apart. Emma had been meticulous about managing our finances. She handled all our joint accounts, managed the bills, took care of investments, she was always on top of it, making sure we were saving for the future, for that nice house we were planning to buy. She'd even joked about how I didn't need to worry about the money because she had it all figured out. Well, tonight I was going to figure it out. I sat down at her desk and opened her laptop. The password was the same as always, her birthday, and once I was in, it was like I'd opened a door into her other world. There it all was, bank accounts, credit cards, everything. Emma had been careful, but she hadn't bothered to hide any of this from me, probably because she never thought I'd care enough to look. But tonight, I cared. I cared a lot. I went straight for our joint savings account. There was a decent chunk of money in there, enough for us to put a down payment on that house we'd been dreaming about. I thought about all the times we'd talked about it, how we'd sit on the porch in the evenings, drink wine, and watch the sun go down. How we'd start fresh in that house, build a new life together. What a joke. I transferred every last dollar out of the joint account into a personal account I'd set up years ago but hadn't used. It was under my name only, something I'd opened before we were married, and I'd forgotten about it until tonight. Now, it was mine. All of it. She wasn't going to touch a single cent of that money. I wasn't done yet. I moved on to the credit cards, her personal accounts. Emma had always liked to spend on nice things, designer clothes, expensive shoes, fancy dinners out with her friends. I could see all her recent purchases laid out in front of me, every dollar she'd spent. Well, now she was going to learn what it felt like to have nothing. I racked up the limits on every card she had, made donations to random charities, bought ridiculous things online, maxing out each one. If she wanted a life without me, fine, but she wasn't going to have any of the luxuries she'd enjoyed up until now. When I was done, I sat back and stared at the screen. It felt good, better than I expected. Emma would wake up tomorrow, check her accounts, and realize that everything she'd thought she had, her carefully planned finances, her savings, her credit, was gone. And there was nothing she could do about it. It wasn't enough, though. Financial revenge was one thing, but I wanted her to feel this on every level. I wanted to hit her where it hurt the most. I thought about it for a while, about what really mattered to Emma. And then it clicked. Her reputation. Emma had built herself a nice little life in the marketing world. She had connections, colleagues who respected her, a position at her firm that she'd worked hard for. She'd told me more than once how proud she was of the relationship she'd cultivated, how she'd been careful to always present herself as a professional, someone reliable and trustworthy. Well, not anymore. I opened her work email. Another birthday password. She really needed to be more creative. Once inside, I started combing through her inbox, looking for anything I could use. It didn't take long. Emails between her and David were there, tucked away in a folder she probably thought was hidden. I read through them, my hands shaking with anger as I saw the flirtations, the late-night meetings they'd set up, the promises she'd made to him about their future together. It was disgusting. I hit forward on every email, sending them directly to her boss and a few key people in the company. The subject line? Important, concerning Emma's conduct. I didn't need to spell it out for them. The emails would do that on their own. Emma's perfect little career was about to go up in flames, and there was nothing she could do to stop it. I shut the laptop, feeling an odd sense of satisfaction. She'd wake up to a nightmare, one she'd never see coming. And I wouldn't have to lift a finger after tonight. All the pieces were set in motion, her finances ruined, her reputation shattered, her entire life crumbling around her. And the best part? She had no idea yet. As I stood up and headed for the door, I heard her footsteps behind me. She was still crying, but quieter now, her voice shaky. 
Where are you going? She asked, her voice hoarse. Out, I said, not even bothering to look at her. Please, she said, stepping closer. We can talk about this. I'll. I'll fix it, I swear. Just give me a chance. I turned to face her, and for the first time that night, I saw it. Real fear. She wasn't just crying out of guilt anymore. She knew something had changed, that I wasn't going to be the understanding, forgiving husband she expected me to be. The one who'd always let things slide, who'd swallow his pride and take her back. You've already broken it, I said coldly. There's nothing to fix. She reached for my arm, her hand shaking. No, please. I'll quit my job, I'll never see him again. I swear to you, it's over with David. I love you. You have to believe that. I stared at her hand on my arm, feeling nothing but disgust. You love me? I asked, my voice dripping with disbelief. You're kidding yourself if you think I'll ever believe a word you say again. I'll prove it, she whispered, her tears flowing harder now. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll fix everything. Just don't leave. Please. I pulled my arm away from her, stepping back. It's too late. She looked at me, eyes wide and full of panic, but I didn't care. I turned and walked out the door, slamming it behind me. I could hear her sobbing as I made my way to the car, but I didn't stop. Let her cry. Let her feel the weight of everything she'd destroyed. As I drove away, I felt lighter, like some of the rage had finally bled out. The revenge wasn't done, though. Emma had gotten what was coming to her, but there was still one more person left. David. And he wasn't going to get off easy either. David. His name sat in my mind like a bad taste I couldn't get rid of. As I drove away from the house, the anger I felt toward Emma simmered in the background. But this, this rage was different. Emma was my wife, someone I trusted with everything, and she'd ripped the trust apart. But David? He was the outsider, the one who saw an opening and jumped right in, knowing full well what he was doing. He wasn't some innocent bystander caught up in a moment. He was the other guy, and he'd had no problem walking into my life and stealing what was mine. He deserved something more personal. And I was going to make sure he got it. I pulled into a gas station and parked in one of the darker spots, out of the way. My mind was buzzing with ideas, each more satisfying than the last, but I needed to be smart about this. David wasn't some random nobody. He worked with Emma, he had a good job, a wife of his own, and kids. He had a lot to lose, which made my job even easier. The more someone has to lose, the more satisfying it is when you take it all away. I scrolled through my phone and found David's Facebook profile. I'd looked at it once before, back when Emma had mentioned him in passing. I hadn't thought much of it at the time, he seemed like just another work colleague. His profile was pretty standard pictures of his family, vacations, the occasional work-related post. He had a wife named Sarah, two kids, and a nice suburban life. The kind of life that looks perfect from the outside but is probably rotting underneath. Well, I was about to make sure it rotted a little faster. I tapped through his photos, learning more about him in minutes than I'd cared to know before. There was a pattern David was careful. He didn't post much, but his wife did. Sarah seemed like the type who liked to put their entire life online, every family outing, every birthday party, every holiday. And there he was, smiling in every photo, standing next to his wife and kids like he hadn't just been screwing around with mine. I was disgusted. How could someone live like that? How could he come home to his family, kiss his kids goodnight, sit down for dinner with his wife, and act like everything was fine, like he wasn't sneaking off to be with another man's wife? I couldn't take it. I wasn't going to sit here and watch him live that double life anymore. He'd taken something from me, so now I was going to take something from him. First things first, I needed more information. I already knew where he worked Emma's office. I had the address, I had his email, and I had his phone number. But I needed something more personal, something that would make this revenge feel right. I started by sending a message to Sarah. It was simple, direct. Hey, 
I think you should know that your husband's been having an affair with my wife. I'm sorry to break this to you, but you deserve to know the truth. Let me know if you want proof. I stared at the message for a few seconds before hitting send. My hands were steady. There was no hesitation. Sarah deserved to know, and I was going to give her the truth. No lies. No sugarcoating. But that wasn't enough. Telling his wife was the easy part. I wanted David to feel this. I wanted him to know that the world he'd been so carefully balancing was about to come crashing down. So I opened up my email and started typing a message to his boss. I'd already outed Emma to her company, so why not do the same for him? Let's see how well they liked having two employees engaged in a months-long affair on company time. The subject line was simple, regarding David's conduct. Inside, I laid out the facts, just like I had for Emma. I attached the same emails, showing the times they'd met up under the guise of work and the inappropriate messages that had nothing to do with business. I didn't add anything emotional. I just presented the facts. Cold. Hard. Evidence. I hit send. It wasn't just about his job, though. No, David's perfect little world was bigger than that. I remembered one of the photos from his Facebook profile he'd posted about coaching his kid's soccer team. There he was, grinning in the middle of a group of young boys, his arm around his son, wearing the coach's uniform. I could see it now, the proud family man, out there teaching teamwork and sportsmanship, all while he was sneaking behind his wife's back. That hypocrisy made me sick. I looked up the local soccer league online. It wasn't hard to find. A few clicks later, I had their contact information. I composed a quick message, something about how they might want to reconsider having someone like David involved in their youth program. I mentioned the affair, threw in a few details about his lack of morals, and sent it off to the league administrators. It wasn't going to ruin his life, but it was going to make things uncomfortable for him. And that was the point. I sat back in my seat, feeling a sense of satisfaction. But there was still more to do. It wasn't just about causing chaos in his life. I wanted to confront him. I wanted to look him in the eye and make him feel the weight of what he'd done. So I texted him directly. Meet me tomorrow at 10 a.m. You know where. Don't make me come to you. I didn't expect a response right away, but it didn't take long. My phone buzzed about five minutes later, and I glanced down to see his reply. Who is this? I smirked. As if he didn't know. I typed back, you know who this is. And we both know what you've been doing. Tomorrow. 10 a.m. There was a pause, and then another message popped up. You don't want to do this. I laughed. The arrogance, the sheer nerve of this guy. He actually thought he could tell me what I did or didn't want to do. He was wrong. So, I replied one more time, show up. Or I'll show up at your office. I didn't hear anything after that, but I knew he'd be there. Guys like David don't like their dirty laundry being aired out in the open. He wasn't going to risk me going public, showing up at his workplace or worse, at his house. The next morning, I got up early. I didn't want to see Emma. I didn't want to deal with her tears, her apologies, her pleas to work things out. I wasn't in the mood to hear any of it. This wasn't about her anymore. I threw on some clothes, grabbed my keys, and drove to the spot where I told David to meet me. It was a quiet parking lot on the edge of town, the kind of place where people went to make shady deals or disappear for a while. No one came here unless they had a reason. I parked my car and waited. The air was thick with anticipation, my heart pounding in my chest as the minutes ticked by. Part of me wondered if he'd actually show, or if he'd try to weasel his way out of this like a coward. But as I sat there, I saw his car pull into the lot. He parked a few spaces away, and for a moment, neither of us moved. I watched him in the driver's seat, his hands gripping the wheel. He was probably trying to decide if he should just drive away. But he didn't. After a few seconds, he opened the door and stepped out. I got out of my car, too, and walked toward him. 
He looked exactly like I remembered average height, average build, nothing special. Just a guy. But this wasn't about appearances. This was about what he'd done. Mark, he said, his voice tense. He tried to act calm, but I could see the fear in his eyes. What do you want? What do I want? I repeated, stopping a few feet away from him. I want to know why you thought you could screw my wife and get away with it. He flinched at my words, glancing around like he was worried someone might hear. Look, I didn't. I didn't want this to happen. It just did. Bullshit, I snapped. You knew exactly what you were doing. You went after her. You knew she was married, and you didn't care. So, now you're going to answer for it. Answer for it? His voice cracked a little, and I could see the panic starting to rise. Come on, man, it's not like that. It's not, we didn't plan this. We just, connected. I stepped closer, and he took a step back. Connected? I spat. Is that what you call it? Sneaking around behind my back, lying to your wife, lying to your kids. That's how you connect with people? I'm sorry, all right, he said, his hands up in some pathetic gesture of surrender. I didn't mean for it to go this far. It was a mistake. You don't get it, I said, my voice low and dangerous. You ruined my life. And now I'm going to ruin yours. His eyes widened, and he took another step back. Wait, wait, what are you talking about? I've already told your wife, I said, watching the color drain from his face. I've told your boss. And by now, the soccer league knows exactly who's been coaching their kids. So, go home, David. Go home and watch as your perfect little life crumbles around you. His face went pale. He opened his mouth to say something but no words came out. He just stood there, stunned, as the reality of what I'd done sank in. Next time, I said, stepping back, think twice before you fuck with someone else's life. I turned and walked back to my car, leaving him standing there, speechless. As I drove away, I felt nothing but satisfaction. David's life was about to fall apart, and I didn't have to do anything but watch. I didn't go home right after dealing with David. Instead, I drove around aimlessly, not really thinking about where I was going. My mind kept replaying the encounter in the parking lot, how his face had gone pale, how his words had stuttered when he realized that his life was falling apart. It gave me some satisfaction, I won't lie. But there was this other part of me that felt, hollow. Like no matter how much I destroyed his life or wrecked Emma's, it wasn't going to fix what was already broken. By the time I pulled into our driveway, it was late. The sun had already set, casting long shadows across the lawn. Emma's car was still there, parked where I'd left it earlier. I sat in my own car for a few minutes, just staring at the house. It looked so normal from the outside. Our home. The place where we were supposed to grow old together. But now it was just a shell empty, fake, like everything else. I finally got out of the car and walked up to the front door. My steps felt heavier than usual, like every inch of me was weighed down by the reality of what had happened. When I opened the door, the house was quiet. Too quiet. I half expected to find Emma gone, but no, she was still here. Sitting on the couch in the living room, her face red and swollen from crying. She looked up when she heard me come in, and for a moment, we just stared at each other. No words. No accusations. Just silence, thick and suffocating. She looked smaller than I remembered, almost fragile in a way I hadn't noticed before. But I wasn't about to feel sorry for her. Not after everything. I didn't think you'd come back, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. Yeah, well, I muttered, kicking off my shoes, there's still some stuff to settle. She wiped her face with the back of her hand, sniffling. Mark, I'm... I don't even know what to say. I've spent the whole day thinking, and I know I've screwed everything up. I know I hurt you in ways I can't even begin to apologize for. I stood there, arms crossed, watching her as she struggled to find the right words. Part of me wanted to tell her to save it, that it was too late for apologies. 
But another part of me, well, I needed to hear what she had to say. If only to confirm what I already knew that this was over. I don't even know how it got to this point, she continued, her voice shaking. I never wanted this to happen. I never wanted to hurt you. I swear, I didn't wake up one day and decide to cheat. It just, it happened. You keep saying that, I said coldly. Like you're trying to convince yourself it wasn't a choice. But every time you met him, every time you lied to me, it was a choice. So, stop pretending you just fell into this. She winced at my words, like they physically hurt her. I'm not trying to make excuses, Mark. I know I fucked up. I know that I betrayed you, and I can't take that back. But I need you to understand, it wasn't about you. Wasn't about me? I let out a bitter laugh, sitting down in the armchair across from her. It was about us, Emma. You and me. You didn't just cheat on me, you cheated on everything we built together. You threw it all away for, what? Some guy from work who made you feel alive. She didn't respond right away. She just stared at the floor, her hands clasped tightly in her lap. I felt like I was drowning, she whispered finally. In this, routine, this life we had. Everything felt so predictable, so, stagnant. And I didn't know how to fix it. David was a mistake, I see that now. But at the time, I thought he was. I don't know, something different. Something that would make me feel like I wasn't just going through the motions every day. Going through the motions, I repeated, shaking my head. We've been together for nine years, Emma. We've built a life, a marriage. You don't go through the motions when you're supposed to be committed to someone. I was committed, she said, her voice rising. At least I tried to be. But you weren't there, Mark. You weren't really there. And what the hell does that mean? I snapped. I was here, Emma. I was working, I was taking care of things. I was with you. What else was I supposed to do? She looked up at me then, her eyes brimming with tears again. You didn't see me, she said quietly. You didn't notice how unhappy I was. How lonely I felt. I kept waiting for you to ask, for you to realize that I was struggling. But you never did. And I know that's not an excuse for what I did, but it's the truth. I felt like I was screaming for help, and you didn't hear me. Her words stung, but I didn't want to let them in. I didn't want to admit that maybe, just maybe, there was some truth to what she was saying. I wasn't going to let her shift the blame onto me, though. This wasn't about me being a bad husband. This was about her betraying everything we had. So, this is my fault now? I asked, my voice cold. Because I didn't notice you were unhappy? No, she said, shaking her head. I'm not blaming you. I'm just, trying to explain. I should have talked to you. I should have told you how I was feeling. I know that now. But at the time, I didn't know how to say it. And then David came along, and I made the worst mistake of my life. There it was again, that mention of David. Like he was some kind of savior who'd swooped in and given her what I couldn't. I hated hearing his name. I hated the thought of him being a part of this, of our marriage. You're damn right it was the worst mistake, I muttered. And now, we're here. I know, she whispered, her voice barely audible. I know I can't fix this. I can't undo what I did. But? I love you, Mark. I really do. And if there's any chance, any chance at all, I want to try and save us. I want to make things right. I looked at her, really looked at her, for the first time since this all started. She was a mess, tears streaming down her face, hair disheveled, eyes swollen from crying. And I realized that, in spite of everything, some part of me still loved her too. But that didn't change the fact that she had broken something between us, something that couldn't be easily repaired. I don't know if there's anything left to save, I said quietly, my voice thick with emotion. Her face crumpled, and she let out a sob. Please, Mark. I know I don't deserve it, but I'm begging you, don't walk away. Don't give up on us. 
I rubbed my hands over my face, trying to think clearly. Could I forgive her? Could I really look past what she'd done and try to rebuild our marriage? Or was it too late, had she gone too far? The silence stretched between us, heavy and oppressive. She was waiting for me to say something, to give her an answer, but I didn't have one. Not yet. I needed time. Time to figure out what I really wanted, what I could live with. I need space, I finally said, my voice firm. I can't just decide right now. I need time to think. She nodded, wiping her face with the sleeve of her shirt. Okay. I understand. I think you should leave for a while, I added. Go stay with your sister or a friend. I need the house to myself. I can't. I can't be around you right now. Her eyes filled with panic. Mark, please. I'm not saying it's forever, I cut her off. I just need time to think. To figure out if we even have a chance. She hesitated, then nodded slowly. All right. I'll go. But, please, don't shut me out. Please, don't just, disappear. I'll do whatever it takes to fix this. I swear, I'll do anything. I didn't respond. I couldn't. The truth was, I didn't know what I was going to do yet. Part of me wanted to forgive her, to try and move on, but another part of me, an angrier, more hurt part, wanted to walk away and never look back. She stood up slowly, wiping her eyes one last time before grabbing her phone and keys from the table. I'll pack a bag, she said quietly. And I'll go. I watched her walk upstairs, the sound of her footsteps muffled by the carpet. A few minutes later, she came back down with a small suitcase, her face pale and drawn. She stood by the door for a moment, looking at me like she wanted to say something, but then she just nodded and walked out. The door clicked shut behind her, and for the first time all day, I was alone. I sat there in the silence, staring at the empty space where she'd just been. The weight of everything hit me all at once, the betrayal, the anger, the sadness, the uncertainty. I didn't know what to feel anymore. I didn't know if there was even a right way to feel. I leaned back in the chair, closing my eyes. I had no idea what the future held. All I knew was that everything had changed. And nothing was ever going to be the same again. The silence in the house felt different now. It wasn't the kind of silence I used to appreciate after a long day, when Emma would be upstairs reading or watching TV and I could just sit on the couch and unwind. No, this was the kind of silence that pressed down on me, reminding me that nothing was the same. She was gone, her suitcase in the car, staying at her sister's, or God knows where else. I wasn't sure how I felt about it yet. There was a small sense of relief, maybe, but mostly it felt like I was still in the middle of a storm, with no real direction forward. I stood up from the chair and walked around the living room, looking at everything that suddenly felt like it belonged to someone else. The photos were still scattered across the floor from when I'd smashed them earlier. Broken glass glinted under the dim light of the lamps, the pictures, of us, of our life, now just debris. I picked one up. It was from our wedding day, Emma laughing, holding her bouquet, and me standing beside her with a grin like I'd just won the lottery. Back then, it had felt like I did. But now, looking at it, all I could see was how naive I'd been, how I had no idea what was coming. I let the photo drop back onto the pile and went to the kitchen. The refrigerator hummed softly, another constant in a house full of things that no longer made sense. I grabbed a beer from the fridge and twisted off the cap, leaning against the counter as I took a long sip. The cold liquid hit the back of my throat, but it didn't take the edge off. I wasn't drinking to drown anything out, I just needed to do something with my hands. David was probably dealing with the fallout from everything I'd set in motion. I wondered what his house looked like right now, whether his wife, Sarah, had confronted him, if she'd kicked him out, or if she was still in shock. I wasn't sure if that made me feel any better. Hurting him had felt necessary, like I needed to show him that he couldn't just destroy my life and walk away. But now that it was done, now that he was dealing with the consequences, it all felt empty. I had thought revenge would feel like justice. Like maybe if I burned everything down, I'd feel some kind of satisfaction, some closure. But the truth was, it just felt like a bigger mess. 
The problem was that no matter what I did to him, it didn't fix what was broken between me and Emma. And that's where the real pain came from. I finished the beer and tossed the bottle into the sink, not caring about the clatter it made. Then I headed upstairs, knowing I needed to figure out what the next step was. Divorce? Reconciliation? Could I even imagine forgiving her after what she'd done? I didn't know. Part of me was still in shock, still processing the fact that the woman I thought I knew better than anyone had been living a double life. Upstairs, the bedroom was just as I'd left it. The bed was unmade, the sheets wrinkled from the restless night before, and the floor was littered with broken picture frames. I sat down on the edge of the bed, my head in my hands, feeling the weight of it all. I couldn't stay in this house. Not right now. It was too full of memories, too full of everything that had happened. Everywhere I looked, I saw her, us, what we used to be, what we were supposed to be. It was suffocating. I grabbed my phone and scrolled through my contacts until I found the number for a hotel nearby. It was a cheap place, nothing fancy, but that was fine. I wasn't looking for comfort. I just needed to get out, to have some space to think. I packed a bag quickly, just the basics, clothes, my laptop, a few toiletries. I didn't know how long I'd be gone, and I didn't care. I just needed to not be here, not in this house that felt like a reminder of all the things I couldn't change. As I zipped up the bag, I looked around the room one last time. It didn't feel like home anymore. Maybe it never would again. The hotel room was small and bare, the kind of place where the only decorations were generic paintings of landscapes you'd never visit. I threw my bag on the bed and sat down, staring at the ugly wallpaper for a few minutes before pulling out my phone. There were a few missed calls, none from Emma. I wasn't sure if I was relieved or disappointed. I wasn't ready to talk to her yet, but a part of me wondered if she was out there somewhere, waiting for me to make the first move. I scrolled through the messages. There were a couple from friends, mostly small talk or asking if I wanted to grab a beer sometime soon. Normal stuff, the kind of texts I would have answered without a second thought a few days ago. But now? Now I couldn't even think about pretending everything was fine. Then I saw one message that caught my eye. It was from Emma's sister, Claire. I opened it, feeling a pit form in my stomach. Hey, Mark. I know this is awkward but Emma's here with me. She's a wreck. I'm not saying you need to talk to her right now, but, please, just don't make any rash decisions. Give yourself time. If you need anything, let me know. I stared at the message for a long time. Claire and I had always gotten along well enough, but we'd never been particularly close. Still, the fact that she was reaching out made me pause. It wasn't just that Emma was hurting, of course, she was. She knew she'd screwed up, and now she was dealing with the consequences. But Claire was right about one thing, I needed time. I couldn't make a decision in the middle of all this chaos, not when everything was still so raw. I didn't respond to her message. I didn't know what to say. Instead, I threw the phone down on the bed and stood up, pacing the small room. Time. Everyone kept saying that, but how much time was enough? And what would time even change? Emma had cheated. She'd betrayed me in the worst possible way. And no amount of waiting or thinking was going to erase that fact. I thought about what she'd said during our last conversation, that she felt like she was drowning in the routine, like I wasn't there for her. I'd heard those words before, from other people, in other stories, but I never thought they'd apply to us. I thought we were stronger than that. I thought we'd built something that could withstand the day-to-day -day grind of life. I guess I'd been wrong. But still, was it worth throwing away everything we'd built together? Nine years. That wasn't something you just walked away from easily. We had a history, and not all of it was bad. In fact, most of it had been good until this. I knew that relationships went through rough patches, that people made mistakes. But was this mistake too big? Too final? I sat down on the edge of the bed, running my hands through my hair. My mind kept flipping back and forth. One minute, I was convinced there was no way I could ever forgive her. 
The next, I was thinking about how much I still loved her, despite everything. And that's what made this so hard. The love was still there, buried under all the anger and betrayal, but it hadn't disappeared. That was the problem. I picked up my phone again and stared at Claire's message. I thought about Emma, sitting at her sister's house, probably crying herself to sleep. I thought about what she'd said, that she was sorry, that she wanted to fix things. Could I really believe that? Could I trust her again? I didn't have an answer. But I knew one thing, I couldn't make this decision alone. I opened my contacts and found the number for a marriage counselor that a friend had recommended a while back. We'd never gone, Emma and I, because we thought we didn't need it. But now, things were different. I wasn't sure if counseling would fix anything, or if we were even salvageable. But I had to try, if only to know for sure. I dialed the number, and after a few rings, a voice answered. Hello, this is Dr. Andrews. Hi, I said, my voice shaking slightly. I'd like to schedule an appointment, for marriage counseling. There was a pause, and then the voice on the other end softened. Of course. Let's find a time that works for you. As we set up the appointment, I felt a strange sense of relief. Not because I knew things would get better, but because I was finally taking a step towards something, whatever that something was. When I hung up the phone, I sat back on the bed, staring at the blank wall in front of me. This wasn't the ending I'd imagined for us. It wasn't the happily ever after that people talk about. But maybe, just maybe, it wasn't the end. Maybe it was the start of something different, something new. I didn't know if we would make it through this. I didn't know if I could ever fully forgive her, or if she could forgive herself. But I was willing to find out. And that, for now, was enough. Tomorrow, I'd call Emma. Tomorrow, we'd start figuring out what came next. Together or apart. But for tonight, I was alone. And that was okay.